can be known by an uplifted hand. Brother Peter Gatchel, would you come and take these prayer requests to the Lord? <clears throat> Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have in this end time to come together, Lord, to hear more of your word, to praise you and worship you, Lord, and to do as your word says, is not to ask amiss, but to ask according to your perfect will and to ask the things that we need, Lord. And we all have requests, the uplifted hand indicating the things that are on our heart, the things that we need, Lord, and we know that your word promises that if we ask according to your word and we ask according to what we know your will to be, Lord, that you'll give it to us, Father. And we have comfort in that, Lord. And that's why in the end days, your children can just ripen in the sun and we can sit back and relax, Lord, and have that relationship with you as we draw closer and closer. And that, that modicum of that Holy Ghost in us, Lord, continue to grow. And Father, we just... Thank you for all these things you're doing in the end time, Lord. And we thank you for how you're gathering your bride together, Lord, with the truth of your word and your spirit, Lord. And so we put these requests, Lord, before you. And we, we ask them the journey mercies that were spoken of and the things that are in the hearts of each of us, Lord. And so, Father, we ask you in the, the name you've told us to ask. And that's the name of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You'll have to forgive me. I didn't realize I had a rasp in my throat, and I can't sing anyways, but boy, it's sure hard tonight. <clears throat> Let's uh, try number 138, The Solid Rock. <clears throat> my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. But wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood supports me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, then he is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Amen. God bless you this evening. <clears throat> Let us all stand and we'll change your order of service and ask Brother Brian to come. <coughs> Excuse me. Only believe. Only believe. All things are possible. <coughs> Only believe. Only believe. Only believe. Things are possible, only believe.
Jesus, you're here. Jesus, you're here. All things are possible now that you're here. Jesus, you're here. Jesus, you're here. And all things are possible now that you're here. Amen. If we'd open our Bibles to John chapter 14, we're going to read from verse 19 for our text. <clears throat> Yet a little while in the world seeth me no more, but ye see me. And because I live, ye shall live also. Let's bow our heads in prayer. The gracious and loving Father, we come to you in thanksgiving. This new year of 2016. And Father, I never thought that we would make it to such a year because I've been looking for the resurrection every spring for the past 40 years. But knowing it doesn't make much difference as long as you're here with us. Yet we all long to be out of this pest house where things in the world get worse and worse and worse each year. But we also hear, Lord, we're here to, to give thanksgiving to thee this evening for coming down to this hour to give us life and rest through your shout, your message. And we pray that we will indeed be ready for the voice of the resurrection very soon. And we know that your shout is a message. And that message is life to us. And we thank thee, Father, for not only giving us the promise of eternal life through your son, Jesus, but for coming down in this hour and manifesting that life to us so that we can have an understanding of how that we must act in accordance with that eternal life that you have given to us through your son, Jesus Christ. And we saw it in your prophet, a yielded vessel. And we ask, Father, that we might also be yielded sons and daughters of thee, and we thank you for your word of life. And we believe your word is a seed. And as a seed, it contains life, your seed, and thus your life. And we know that every seed must bring forth after its kind, for that is the law of reproduction. And we know that when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then we shall also appear with him in glory. We know these things, Father, and we're thankful for them. And we know that this glory that we are to appear is to openly manifest that's your doxa, that's your opinion, your judgment, your assessment, your values, which is your very mind coming into us, your children. So we're thankful, Father, and we are a thankful people for all that you're doing here in this small congregation and for all those who through the ministry throughout the world are hooked up with us. And therefore, Father, we commit ourselves to your great purpose and plan that you've made known to us in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This evening, we'll pick up at uh, paragraph 162 of the token where Brother Bram said, it proves that God raised him from the dead. you believe it? He's a living among us today. And that I is Christ. And that I is with us to the end of the consummation. Now, that I is referring to is where he says, yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye shall see me, because I live, you shall live also. And Brother Brown says, that I is Christ, and that I is with us to the end of the consummation, which is the end of the world. See, the end of the world. According to his promised word, he promised it, and the works that I do, I do, shall you do also. It's not nonsense to us. It's the token. It's, it is the token. We accepted this sacred blood sacrifice. We accept his blood, his sacrifice, his blood. And then give, see, that, that gives us the life, the token, a seal of his promise. Ephesians 4 and 30 said, grieve not the blood, no. Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are covenanted, you're put away. You are covenanted, you are a token. The, the Holy Spirit will be the seal. Paragraph 163 says, when anything sealed inside of a seal... You better not break it. You can't break it. Not God's seal. No. 
For you are now grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of your redemption, when the body's raised up. It's a seed, a sign that the seed has been germatized with eternal life. Zoe, my own life, and I'll raise it up again at the last day. And as you walk, you have confidence that the life of Christ is in you. And you are in him. And by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body and sealed there by the Holy Ghost among the believers like this until the day that Jesus raises up again. You know, these thoughts here that Brother Brown is talking about, the fact that the seed of God in us has been germatized by his life, his divine presence, it gives us a confidence that the life of Christ is in us. We're going to focus a little bit on that confidence tonight. And we all know, and I think I've I've preached on it many times, on the parhesia of God, which is the confidence. We're going to go into a little bit tonight. Now, in nature, we know that the life is in a seed, and once it's planted and, and the light of the sun strikes it, the life in the seed begins its journey towards manifestation of its true nature. In other words, it begins its life cycle towards an expression of what life in nature is intrinsically in that seed. And that is the law of life, as we've seen in Genesis 1.11, which tells us that every seed will bring forth after its kind, after its nature. I've been meditating a lot recently on things that Brother Branham said about when we were in him before the foundations of the world. And he made a statement. He said, you know, God's kids. He said, God knew that some of them would like mountains and rivers and lakes, so he made mountains and rivers and lakes. (laughs) And I just think about how I know I've longed just long it's been that millennial dream. You'd have a house on the side of a mountain, a river or a lake out front, a small brook running through the back door back back porch so I can dip my bucket and drink of that cold, cool water. And I think, you know, that desire wouldn't be there if God hadn't placed it there. Because we are seeds. And the nature of those seeds and the, and the attributes and characteristics, you know, which as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's who I am. That's who you are. Some people like the desert. That's why they're in Tucson. I don't care for the desert. I, I get out in the desert and I, I just thirst. Even though I might have a bottle of water in my hand, I just, I'm thirsty all the time. I just, it scares me to look around and see no water. That's just my nature. That's their nature. <clears throat> but in Genesis 1.11, he said, Every seed will bring forth after its kind. And if we are the seed of God, then we will be brought forth after his kind. Now, we know according to biological science that until the light strikes the seed, the seed will not manifest the innate natures of the life that lays within it. So it takes the light to manifest the life. In fact, the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians 5 and 13, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. And we see this law of life is a spirit in the spiritual as well as in the nature. In fact, I believe it's the Colossians, I may be wrong, maybe Philippians, but Paul talks about the law of life in Christ Jesus. So you have the law of life in Genesis 1.11, which is the law of all life, and then you have the law of life in Christ Jesus, which is the spiritual application of that. And we know that Christ is the light of the world. And according to John 1 and 3, it tells us all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now we know that the Son of God was a dual being. Sometimes the Father was speaking, sometimes the Father uh, was the Son of God speaking. But uh, as Brother Branham said, from Sirs we would see Jesus. He said, now Jesus was born for one purpose, and that was for God to manifest himself through that body. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He was a body that was made physical, that men and women could see, uh, see what he thought, and his expressions to the people in his gra- gratefulness. And his attitude towards all mankind, he expressed it through Christ. Now, Christ seemed to be a dual personality. He would speak sometimes, and they scratched their heads, and they didn't understand him. He'd speak one, uh, one thing one time, look like, and something else another time. That, uh, that, uh, what was it? Or what it was, it was Jesus speaking and then Christ speaking. Jesus was the man, Christ was the God that was in him. 
Not me that doeth the works, my Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. See, God will not share his glory with no one. So, <clears throat> Brother Branham is making a distinction between the man Jesus and then the Christ Jesus, being the anointed Jesus, being that that was God in him. From it as I be not afraid, he said, Now the Holy Spirit is here, and Jesus said, If I do not the works of my Father, then don't believe me. And I, and I could show you more quotes. I, we're not going to get into that tonight, but I could show you quotes from Brother Brown. So then if you don't do the works of Christ, then nobody has to believe you either. And if your church doesn't do the works of Christ, he said, they shouldn't have to believe it either. Because why should we say, well, Jesus did it, so we have to believe, but now you don't do it, and we're going to believe you? I'm sorry. <clears throat> the fact that we have had a vindicated prophet that did the works... And we could say, okay, God was with the man. Now when he, we opened up our Bibles and we saw the doctrine, hey, God backed him up, he vindicated him. Well, what about the fivefold ministry? If there's no vindication, if there's no indication or vindication there that the man is preaching right, if there's no signs and following, if there's, you know, look, the signs have to follow every believer. So if you've got a pastor who doesn't even have signs himself, he ought to step out of the pulpit. I'm sorry, because it's just a man in the pulpit. You see? We've we got to have God in our lives, every one of us. Because it says, these signs shall follow them that believe. Now, if you're a believer, there will be the signs there. If they're not, then, then there won't be. And if you've got a, a bunch of preachers in the pulpit that there's no signs taking, no, there's no signs following, they're not called to the ministry. In fact, they're not even born again. They're not even believers. And that's what it comes down to, because gee, Brother Bram said in John 14, 12, I, I don't know why I'm getting off into this, but... Uh, Brother Brown said in John 14, 12, he said, he that believeth on me, he said, that's a believer. He said, you can't be a believer until you have the Holy Ghost. And we got a lot of people who said, well, there's no evidence of the Holy Ghost, so therefore I got it because I'm listening to tapes. I'm sorry, but you're wrong. Tapes doesn't give you the Holy Ghost. Anyway. All right. Show me scripture for that. Now. Faith cometh by hearing, yes. But the Holy Ghost doesn't come by listening to tapes. It comes by, you have to die first. <clears throat> now the Holy Ghost is here and Jesus said, if I do not the works of my Father, then don't believe me. Is that right? They couldn't believe him being a man, being God. They just couldn't see it. Uh, that, that that could be anything. said, you make yourself equal to God being the Son of God. Now, now we know that Jesus was Son. He said, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he seeth the Father doeth. Thomas saith, show us the Father, and it suffices. Now, let me just say one more thing, because it just came to my mind while we're doing this. But if Jesus Christ could do nothing until the Father showed him, then Jesus Christ was dependent on the Father, then Jesus Christ was only echoing what the Father showed him. So then, if we are sons and daughters of God... And we are born again, birthed again of a supernatural spirit. Then a supernatural ought to be there. Then we ought to be able to see what God wants done, step into that vision and do it. See, they just couldn't see it, that that could be, could be anything. They said, you make yourself equal being the son of God. Now we know Jesus was son. He said, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he seeth the Father doeth. Thomas said, show us the Father, and it'll satisfy us. <clears throat> he said, I've been so long with you, and you don't know me. He that has seen me has seen the Father. It's not me that doeth the works. It's my Father that dwelleth in me. God is spirit. Jesus was the man. He was a tabernacle that God dwelt in. See, now, he had the spirit without measure, like all that water out there in the sea. That was what was in him. But in us is just a spoonful out of it. We got it by measure. But remember, the same chemicals that's in the whole sea is in the spoon. Not as much of it, but the same kind. Amen. See, that's right. And that's the reason he said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. See, Brother Bram's saying, it's got to be there. <clears throat> now, when he showed his Messiah sign, that was for some. We saw a Messiah sign in, in uh, uh, Samuel. We saw it in, brother, in Jesus. We saw it in Brother Branham. We saw it in some. He says, that's for some. He was a teacher. Here they are. Here's, uh, here's different things. What all he done. Here it is represented in his church. So teaching was also a works that I do shall you do also. Right? Laying hands on the sick. That was something he did. We will also do. You see, he fed the poor. That's something he did. We will also do. You know, you can look at every single thing that Jesus did, and you know that that's for some. 
No, not everybody's going to feed the poor. Not everybody's going to be a teacher. Not everybody's going to do, you know, uh, lay hands and, and, and be healed. But, but those things are there. He had it without measure. And, you, you know, in, in the church there's diversities of gifts. There's different things that each one has. But those are works of Christ. They're works of an anointing upon you. Okay? <clears throat> now, here it is. Here it is represented in his church. He's here to help you, and we're here preaching the word, doing everything we can to help you. So he's talking about the very same life, and thus the very same nature, and thus the very same attributes and characteristics of his life. Jesus had it without measure, and we have it in a measure. Yet it's the very same life and the very same nature, and thus the very same characteristics and attributes. And if that is so, then the law of life would, re, would, would produce in our vessel the very same life, the very same actions, the very same thinking, the very same speech, and the very same works that was in him. He that believeth in me, he that is filled with my spirit, is able to believe. And these works, this life, the words which I speak, shall they do also. Because it's a seed. That's the thing people are not getting about John fourteen twelve. If you've got the same seed... You will have the same nature, the same characteristics. See, that's why Brother Branham, if you go back to uh, uh, the uh, spoken word is original seed, Brother Branham said, he said, that this is the reason why I've been laying this seed out. I've been laying out this seed so that it'll duplicate. It'll reproduce itself. The Son of Man went for sowing seed, not his own seed. He went for sowing the seed life of God. Because it says these are the children of God. These 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 seed that rise up, these are the children of God. Well it wasn't then it wasn't it wasn't William Branham's seed, it was God's seed that he sowed. <clears throat> you see? In fact, Brother Branham said from thirsting for life, he said, What are Christians to do? Well, we're aliens. But our father is the king. And we are sons and daughters of God. We ought to conduct ourselves like sons and daughters of God. You know, you look out in the world's condition today, and you see that just about any country that the, the believers are in, they're aliens and strangers. You just don't feel at home because this world is crowding you out. They're pushing you out. They're, you know, they're, I mean, they're doing such perverted things today. It's just, it's, it's awful. They're teaching, they're teaching a, a homosexual agenda in the schools, and that's a dictate by the Obama administration. It's absolutely a dictate by the Obama administration. And they're, they're, and they're also teaching the Muslim, uh, I just heard this, this week from uh, Rush Limbaugh, and, and he, he, uh, he quoted three different states, Virginia, Kentucky, no, Virginia, Tennessee, and um, what was the other state? Um, anyway, and then he said, and Kentucky made it, he, he said these states, in the schools, they're actually teaching the children the conversion prayer, like, you know, the conversion prayer of the Christian is John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. You know, you've heard it in every Billy Graham crusade. Well, the conversion prayer in the, in, the, in the Koran is a certain statement that is made. And they're actually teaching that in the schools now, and the kids have to memorize it in three states. And then in Kentucky, they went so far as to say, well, there's a Charlie Brown play that one of the schools is going to do, and they couldn't do it because they were quoting from Luke. So you see, this guy is pushing the agenda. <clears throat> All right. Now, Brother Brown says, we are sons and daughters of God, and we ought, um, well, let me just go back to, he says, what are we Christians to do? We're aliens. But our father is the king, and we're sons and daughters of God, and we ought to conduct ourselves like sons and daughters of God. When I see the church becoming so loose, and the women in their immoral dressing, and the men doing, and the men doing, it grieves, it just grieves me. Because we are sons and daughters of God, and we ought to act and walk and talk and conduct ourselves like that. When we get away from that, I'm afraid there's something wrong in us. We've lost the vision of who we are, because the life that is in us is what guides us and directs us. Again, from the arrow of God's deliverance, he said, I want my experience to match God's Bible. That's the matching time. If you don't match something, now match your experience against Paul's. Amen. That's what we need to do today in matching time with Paul's faith in the Bible. That's our example, right? Uh, real matching time. Don't try to match your neighbor. Match, match some of the saints of the Bible. And if you are a saint, act like a saint, walk like a saint, dress like a saint, talk like a saint, pray like a saint, believe like a saint, dress like a saint, be, a, be like a saint, and live like a saint, die like a saint, and go to heaven like a saint. Amen. 
In other words, everything about you, look, if you're a wheat seed, you're, just, you're not going to be producing cucumbers and tomatoes. You're going to be producing wheat. And if you're, if you're a seed of God, you're going to produce God. That's all you can do. From presuming, he says, so they have come now, Lord, to consecrate themselves, to be set aside from the world, that they don't want nothing to do with the world. They want to be so completely surrendered to you till their whole being reflects Christ that when they walk and talk and dress and act, it's Christ's reflection constantly in their lives. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll grant that to them. My prayer for this little church here and those that are hooked up with us is we become more Christ-like in 2016 than you would have ever thought possible. And that you will have confidence in the token because you see the token manifesting itself in you. Not that you might see it in me or somebody else. Forget me. I've got, I've got to deal with Brian. You have to deal with yourself. And that when you can see Christ in you, it builds a confidence to know. And we're going to look at that, that what that means. And uh, it's tremendous. Because you know that he hears you. You know then that you get your petition. You see? From why Christ speak, he said, Now how we thank thee, Lord, for this. Walk a consecrated life. Give yourself over to sweetness and humility. Walk in the spirit. Walk and talk and dress like, and act like Christians, humble and sweet. Don't let this fail now. And from Christ is the mystery of God revealed, Brother Adam said, and then the word moves on down into the body from the head. Now, what is it? This same word. Now, if it's moving down from the head, and the head has come down in this hour, the head is God. The Bible says that the head of the church is Christ, and the head of, head of Christ is God. When the word moves down into the body from the head, what is it? It's the same word. Nothing can be added or taken from it. So that same word moves from the head as the day comes close down into the body, down into the body, vindicating that they are one. Their husband and wife, their flesh of his flesh, word of his word, life of his life, spirit of his spirit. See, amen. How do we know it? It bears the same record, the same fruit, the same word. See, it manifests Christ's same life, same God, same spirit, same word, same book, amen, same signs. Things that I do shall you do also. Oh, hallelujah. <coughs> Brethren who are hooking up with us around the world are beginning to see in their own churches that, that blessed hope. And they're beginning to see the supernatural presence of God moving in among them and doing things. Now, I can't hardly believe that we've been preaching presence for 30-some years, 40-some years, since 77. And people were preaching just a theology, not a reality. Brother, it's time that we come to a reality. He's here. He is here. You know, they said, well, he was here with Brother Branham. He's still here. Brother Branham said the pillar of fire is leading us to the millennium. Is. Because he's the I am. Now, the prophet's off the scene, but God's still here. From a sermon, we would see Jesus. Brother Branham tells us the reason why John 14, 12 is for everyone. And what it's for, he says, but now, while he's here working with his church in the form of spirit, then if his spirit is with us, he will act just exactly like he acted when he was here on earth. And it'll make you act the same way. Because it's not your spirit anymore. It's his spirit in you. Christ's spirit in you. The things that I do, he that believeth on me, St. John 14, 12, the works that I do shall you do also. See, we'll do the same works. We'll think the same thoughts. Why are you going to do the same works? Because you're thinking the same thoughts. You'll live the same type of a life. If the Spirit of God is in you, it makes you live like Christ. <coughs> Notice, it makes you live. Because sometimes your body's a little contrary to it still. You haven't got to the place where Jesus did in Gethsemane. Nevertheless, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. So the body wants to do something, and the Spirit comes in and checks that. And says, ah, ah, ah. Don't do that. If the Spirit of God is in you, it makes you live like Christ, Christ-like. Then you become a written epistle, read of all men, Christ in you, reflecting his light out of you. Now, didn't we read earlier that Jesus said, I am the light of the world? Didn't we read also that he says, you are the light of the world? Didn't Jesus say the same thing? One place says, I am the light of the world. Next place he says, and you are the light of the world. Don't cover it up. 
his light out of you, as God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself and reflecting God from his own body. No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten of the Father has declared him. God was in Christ, and what Christ's attitude was was God's attitude because the two worked together, the spirit and flesh united. In fact, we're taught in Scripture, as, as he is, so are we. Now, how can we say that if we don't believe it? As he is, so are we in this world, it says. People want to say, well, that's off to the millennium someplace. You know, we manifest the sons after the resurrection. After No, he said, you are now. Now you're sons of God. Now you are. Brother Brown said, that's the problem with the church. They live so below their privilege. We are sons and daughters of God. He said, you have enough power in you. You have enough holy, if you have the Holy Ghost, you have enough power in you to create worlds and to go live on them. As he is, so are we in this world. What is that? John 14, 12. The works that I do shall you do also. As we are, as he is, so are we. It's the same thing. We're becoming united. There's a uniting of the bride of Christ with, with the spirit. You see, the spirit and the bride say, come. Why? Because the things he says, she says also. The works I do shall you do also. The spirit and the bride are so united by the same mind, the same doxa, that they say the same thing. How many times have you found yourself, and you're talking to somebody, and you, you're just, and you say something, and you go, where did that come from? And then the next day or two days or three days later, you're listening to a tape and you hear Brother Bram say it. Because the spirit is identified. See, there's one spirit. It's not you got the spirit and you got the spirit and you got a spirit and you got a spirit. And now we're trying to bring our spirits together to become one spirit. No, there's only one spirit. We're baptized into one body. So it's his spirit in you and you and you and you. That's guiding you, leading you. Sons and God, daughters of God are led by the Spirit of God. They're not led by the pastor. They're not led by the deacon board. That, you know, they're not led by fear that if we get out of line with the authorities, we're going to be lambasted. I don't want anyone ever to have a fear to come into the church unless that fear is that you're living in sin and you know that it'll be exposed by the Holy Ghost. Because I'm looking for that just like Brother Brown. He longed for that. But I hope none of you are living such a life as that. Amen. <clears throat> so, herein is our love made perfect. Now, you know, that, you know that, that you can't enter unless you have perfect love, right? And John tells us here how our love is made perfect. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. When we become conformed to the image of the firstborn son, our love is perfected. That's what he says right here. Herein is our love made perfect, made complete. As he is, so are we in this world. Notice Jesus says in John 8 and 12, Then spake Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And then he says in Matthew five fourteen, You are the light of the world. The works that I do shall you do also. The light that I am, so shall you be. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. So Jesus tells us the same thing had to take place for the life of God to move into the church of the living God. In John 12 and 23, we read, And Jesus answering them said, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. What fruit? You and me. That's the fruit. Because it's the same spirit. The, 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 you know, we, we know that the seed has a life in it. But that life has got to be expressed. And that life has got to come through something. And it had to die so that the shell could be broken out. So the spirit, the life could come out of it. As Brother Brown said on the day of Pentecost, the spirit of God that was in Jesus come back upon us. <clears throat> now, Jesus tells us in John 6 and 63 that the word of God is life. And that the spirit of God quickens that life in us. He said, it is the spirit that quickeneth, that maketh alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, their spirit and their life. And in John 1 and 1, we read, That which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon in our hands of handle of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we've seen it. And we bear witness, and we are showing unto you that eternal life. <coughs> Look, we saw it, and now we're living it. Because when you're looking at us, you're seeing you're seeing, you're looking, isn't that what, exactly what Brother Brown said? He, said? he said, you're looking at me, aren't you? 
he was explaining how when, Je when, when Jesus said, they said, show us the Father, he said, you're looking at me, aren't you? When we saw God in this hour stand before groups of men, who was it? It was William Branham. And now that, that and, and, and uh, <clears throat> for the life was manifested. And we've seen it. That's not just for those apostles back there. That's for you. We've seen it in this hour. And we bear witness. And now, after we bear witness, we are now also showing unto you. We're manifesting unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us and now is manifested through us. Now, the life is in the Father before it comes into the Son, and while it's in the Father, it's still in seed form. <coughs> in John 5, 26, we read, For as the Father hath life in himself, he's the author of life, he's the fountain of life, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. And we know that the life form in which God brings forth his own life is in his word. The Apostle Paul called it the word of life. In Philippians 2, 16, he says, Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither have I labored in vain. <coughs> and again in Acts 5.20, the Apostle Peter says, uh, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And it was Peter who taught us that the new birth comes by the word of God, being sparked off in our being, he said, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. <clears throat> now notice he told us that there are corruptible seeds and there's incorruptible seed. And he tells us that the incorruptible seed is God's word. For all other seed have a beginning and have an ending of life, but there's only one source of eternal life and that is God's own life. Therefore, when you, you receive eternal life is when the very life of God comes into you and it sparks you to the life that he ordained for you even before he spoke the world into existence because you had to be a part of God in order to have eternal life. <coughs> <laughs> in fact, we see the entire plan of God in Ephesians 1. So let's open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1 and begin reading at verse 3. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, so Jesus has both God and Father, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now we're told here that not only is God the Father of Jesus, but he's also the God of Jesus. And he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, now, in the next verse, we see him actually, uh, be, we see that we were in him before the foundations of the world. He said, according as he has chosen us in him, before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy. He chose us to be holy and without blame before him in his presence. Then, because of his great love he has for his own, he sets in order his great plan for his children. And in verse 5, he says, in love, having predestinated us. That's past tense. <coughs> there's no, <coughs> there's no, uh, it's not circumstance or coincidence that we're here, that we're hearing the word of God. He ordained that we would be in him before the foundations of the world. This is what he did while we were yet in his mind before he even framed the worlds. Then when God framed the worlds with us in his mind, he framed them for us to enjoy. God existed for an eternity before he even framed the world, so he didn't do it for himself. That's what you have to understand. Everything he does is not for himself. He could, he could exist for an eternity in the past, which, you know, it's unfathomable to even think eternity. You know, eternity is... But there's also an eternity in the past. There's an eternity in the future. And for an eternity in the past, he was self-existent. Didn't even have a son you know that? For an eternity in the past, didn't even have a son. And then he birthed forth a son. Then he birthed forth sons. You understand? Then he created angels and all these things. <clears throat> so God existed alone. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. But he has such a great capacity for love, and love is always giving. There had to be ones to give to. You know, Peter, before you were married even when you first got married. Before you were married, you had a capacity to be a father. And you had a desire to be a father. And so the capacity and the desire got together, got married, had to, had to have a bedding ground, had to find a wife, had to get married, in order to bring forth children. That's all God did. 
He created us in his own image to do the same thing, to love and to, to reflect and to, you know, just think about what it's going to be like when we don't have all the serpent seed that's in the earth today when they're not here. And you just see brothers and sisters with one father and an eldest brother and a bunch of older brothers like Brother Branham and Paul and the apostles and different ones. What a wonderful place it's going to be. No selfishness, no self-centeredness, no me this, me that. Living for one another, living to please our Father, living to help. I, I, I just, I'm longing for that day. It's coming soon. He even framed the world, so he didn't do it for himself. He didn't need it. He did it for you and me. So that we might enjoy the mountains and the seas and the valleys and the rivers. And he did this so that we might inherit it all. And I'm so excited about inheriting a nice mountain place where I'll have a nice mountain lake in front. Anybody ever been to uh, Lake Sylvan in the Black Hills? If you ever get a chance, that's one place you want to visit and you probably do not want to leave. They have boulders the size of this room sitting right there on the edge of the lake. You sit up there on one of those rocks and you just watch the, the, the mountain goats up on the cliffs and everything else, and it's just beautiful mountain lake, and just mountains all around. <clears throat> I long for that day. And one day I'll see it. And if, you're, if you like the desert, well, we could probably travel like a thought and see each other once in a while, but I'll be, I'll be enjoying my... My plate's up there in the mountain someplace. Okay, let's read verse 5 again. In love, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Notice, in love. His whole motive was love. That he predestinated children, uh, us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ according, uh, according to the good pleasure of his own will. So it was his good pleasure to predestinate us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. Notice, in love having predestinated, having, that's past tense, it's already a done deal, by the way. So if you got the Holy Ghost, you got everything in you that's going to get you there. All you got to do is just die to yourself daily and let him grow and grow and grow. As Jacob had to, had to uh, water the camel, or Isaac had to water the camel, the power, the pact his bride, or excuse me, Eliezer, water the camel to pack the bride home to Isaac. We have to, Brother Baptist, we have to, we have to water the Holy Spirit that's in us. Amen. <laughs> to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Herein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom, and prudence. <clears throat> now, in getting back to the seed life, we also see in John 6 and 68, Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? For thou hast the words of eternal life. So we see that the word is a seed, and the life in that seed is God's life, eternal life. In John five twenty four, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me. Can I see? The hands of those that believe on him that sent. All right. Then he says, Hath you echo everlasting life. And shall not come into condemnation, but you are passed from death unto life. I want you people this year, 2016, to forget 2015 and everything that took place in 2015 and everything that took place in 2014 and on and on and on. And I want you to focus on being a new creature, a new creation in Christ. Focus your life on him. Be single focused. Don't focus on all the gossip and all the things that fly around. Just let it die. Get ready. We have maybe three months to be ready. I'm not setting dates, but I, I really believe with all my heart he's coming very, very soon. And if we're not ready, he said the rapture will take place. He said it'll go right through you if you're not aware of it. I think I even have some quotes here today or tomorrow on that. 
Therefore, the attributes of one ordained and predestined to God life is that they believe the word. Acts 13, 48. He that believeth my word and believeth on him that sent me echoes everlasting life and shall not come into the judgment. That's, you will not come into the tribulation. But we have passed from death unto life. I want you just to get the tribulation totally out of your mind. It's not for you. It's not for you. And you need to tell yourself, when the devil gets on your back, you need to say, that's not for me. That's for you and your, your children. It's not for me. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know how he's going to finish the work which he's began. But it's not my business to know. He promised. He that began the good work in you shall perform it. It's up to him. All I know is I'm going to be ready. I'm being focused. I'm dying to self. That's all I can do. So all you can do is just die. Now, John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. <clears throat> too much, brother, sister, too much of this has been theology to us. And that's death. You know, there's the word that killeth and the word that maketh alive. The spirit maketh alive, the word killeth. Don't look at this as theology. It's a book of relationship. That God wants you to fall in love with him. From the masterpiece, Brother Branham said, we hear the same words from Brother Branham as he spoke in the token. He says, but you can't hide a germatized seed. It comes to, it's got to come forth. Because why? The great sculptor is on the job. Going to build again. So the seed went down the word. When we see St. Paul, St. Peter, James, and John, all those who wrote the word and and the word they wrote become alive, and it lived, and it lived. If you could just see the emails I'm getting from brothers all over the world, all over the world. And they're saying, this word is becoming so real, so alive. And we're beginning to see it alive and living in the people in our church. It's becoming a reality to them, a daily reality. It lived because the seed's a carrier of life. Now, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we hear Jesus tell the, the parable of the Son of Man who went forth sowing seed. And the seed that Jesus was talking about that fell into good ground was the very life that was in him that began to come forth on the day of Pentecost. <coughs> the seed that was sown in the first age has come up to a complete body in the last age. And when planted, the seed will bring forth a crop that is in the same likeness as the seed that went into the ground. Remember, Jesus said, it's expedient that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter can't come. He said, you know, it's expedient that a corn of wheat go into the ground so that it can bring forth many fold. And if Christ, the word, was a seed that was buried in death and came forth when God raised him up from the grave. And then on the day of Pentecost, the same life began to grow up and manifest itself in the church. That if it was the word seed that was buried, then that very life that was in the word must also produce the same life back in the church again at the harvest time. And since we know that the word was made flesh and we beheld his glory and the glory we know is the word doxa, which is the very opinion, the very assessment and values and judgment of God in the earth. Then as the Apostle Paul said, uh, he is to come again and this time he is to be glorified in his church. That's 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 10. <clears throat> and that glorification will be the word again in human beings, sons of God, in which the Apostle Paul said, let this mind that was in Christ be in you. So I see that there are ordained people who will learn to get out of the way and they'll learn to just let go and let God. Amen. Jesus told us the same thing in Luke 6.45, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart, bring it forth that which is good. Notice out of his heart he brings it forth. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. <coughs> Notice that he's telling us that out of the abundance or overflow of the heart, which is the understanding, the mouth will speak. So what things you say is dependent upon what you're thinking. And what you're thinking is dependent on who you are. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. <coughs> Remember, brother... Branham got to the place and said, Brother Lee, all my thoughts are of God. All of them. 
And so we're looking at the fact that our words are only a reflector or reflection of what stage of growth that we are at. Now, the way for any child to grow up is that they begin to speak the words which they hear from their parents speaking. A baby, like any person, is limited to words which he hears from others. And that is why we need to listen to the voice of God on a regular basis. And I'm not talking about just daily. I'm talking about as much as you can. And just as a baby begins to formulate their little mind into a place where they begin to speak intelligible (coughs) words based upon what they hear, so too our minds, spiritually speaking, in order to grow up into the full stature or reflection of our Heavenly Father, must begin to formulate our thoughts into the same words in which He spoke to us. (coughs) In John 5 and 19, Jesus said, The Son can do nothing of Himself, but what He seeth the Father do. He's focused on the Father now. What He seeth the Father do, that that, uh, shows Him to do. That do with the Son likewise. Now I want you to notice that Jesus, like any child, did not have words of his own. We all began our talk, our talking by emulating the words which we heard our mother and our father speak. And Jesus was no different. <clears throat> you see, if you as a husband and wife, you fight with each other, and if you use hard words with each other, your children are going to learn that if they want their way, they're going to use hard words. And if you hit each other, then your children are going to learn that the only way I can get what I want is to use physical violence. And so you're teaching them, you're training them up the way they're going when they get older, not depart. And that's why we have, Brother Brown said, it's not juvenile delinquency, it's parent delinquency. But if we are sons and daughters of God, we die to self. As Brother Brown and I, I put the, uh, the, the booklet out there for all of you sisters to have, and it's on menopause. It was actually written by Sister Rebecca. Sometime, I don't know how many years before she died. But she was talking about when Brother Branham came to her because her mother was going through menopause. And, and it's typical for, about, for a woman to go through, it take about four years. But some women could be on it 15, 20 years. And life can be very, very difficult living with a woman who's on menopause. I'm just sorry to say that, sisters, but that's the facts of life. And so Rebecca got into an argument with her mother and Brother Branham walked in the room and said, Becky... I want to talk to you. Well, Becky saw her dad come in, so she started saying, Mom, you're right, you're right. Forget, you're right. And so when she went in, sat down before her dad, he said, now, Becky, he goes, Dad, I, I, I told her she's right. I told. He said, listen, Becky. He said, let her win. He said, you and I know that you were right and Mom was wrong. But let her win. Husbands, when the wife gets bickery, let her win. If she has to have her own way, let her have it. Is it skin off your teeth? Skin off your back? Might be hair off your head. What does it matter? They're all counted anyway. What does it matter? Let them win. Is life that important? They can't make your spouse happy. Let them win. If, they, if that's all they have in life, is they got to win every little thing, let them have it. Let them win. But as for me, I just want him. John seven sixteen. Then Jesus answered and said, My doctrine is not mine, it's his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak it of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeks his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. (coughs) If the children talk about Jesus and the things of God, then you'll know what is being talked about in the home. But if the child cusses and uses vulgar words, then you also know what kind of atmosphere is in that home. And I've seen it as a pastor. I've seen it both ways. I've seen the children, they're singing Only Believe and some wonderful songs like that, and that's wonderful. I've also seen little boys and, you know, you know through, through the years using cuss words. You know where that's coming from. By their fruits you shall know them. And so we see that Jesus, as our example, said, I can of mine own self do nothing. What I say, what I do, I have been taught by my Father. Even the doctrine I speak is not mine, but his has sent me. <clears throat> now, Jesus told the Pharisees in John eight thirty eight, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. There you go. Train up a child in the way they'll go, and when they get older, not depart. 
And so if we are to grow up into the image of our Father, we must first see him. And then we must recognize what it is that he's doing that we might conform to his image. In 1 John 3, 1 to 3, we read, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. <clears throat> Just think, he's came down this hour, and he's calling you his son. The whole world, you know, they sing their kumbayas. The Catholic Church, they all claim them. The Jews claimed them. They all claim them. But does he claim you? Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself. It's an individual walk. It's not conforming to the preacher. It's not conforming to the deacon board. It's not conforming to each other. It's conforming. It's, it's because you've seen him. You purify yourself to be in his presence. He said, be holy, even as my Father, which is in heaven, is holy. <clears throat> even as he is pure, he says. 1 Corinthians 3 and 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then shall we see face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. <clears throat> now this knowing comes as a result of seeing and experiencing the power and the presence of God. And what Paul is speaking of here is in reference to what he said in verse 9. So let's read verses 9 through 12. He says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part and we preach in part. You know, our sermons are in part because we don't know. But when that which is perfect is come and we have today the perfect revealed word, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child even because I thought as a child. But when I become a man, I put away childish things or childish thinking. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. <clears throat> now, I think we would all agree that Jesus, our older brother, and, and he set the example for what we should grow up into the stature of sons and daughters of God to be. And he has our role model and our absolute for the life that we desire. And so Paul tells us in Romans 8, 29 to 30, I'm going to read it from the Weymouth translation. He says, for those whom he has foreknown beforehand... Ephesians, that's Ephesians 1, 3 to 4. He has also predestined to bear the likeness of his son. That he might be the eldest in a vast family of brothers. Now, show me one scripture where Jesus went around uh, speaking uh, cuss words. Or doing evil things. Therefore, we can see that Jesus is the role model that God, our Father, set before us. <coughs> and Paul tells us himself that we are not to be like children in our thinking forever. He went on to say in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I put away, I put away childish thinking. <coughs> now, I'd like to ask some of the younger folks in here this question. Why would a person put away childish things when they become a man? Because the condition of their mind no longer regards those things as important to them. There was a time that sports was 90% of my life. When the Lord came into my life, sports became a far, far distant. I, I may watch one or two football games a year, and I don't even watch the whole thing. I'm happy to watch a, maybe a quarter of it, just to see a little bit of, of the action. I'm not interested in those things no more. I'm not. Sometimes, you know, Brother Bram would go and watch a Western just to relax, but that was just, it wasn't a desire. It wasn't craving. It was just to get away from everything, get your mind just off so that you can just kind of, like that little film we saw when Christina got married, you can get in your box, you men, that has nothing in it. Go down in your room and just, what you doing? Nothing. Women don't understand that. But a man's got to do is nothing. <clears throat> you see, Malachi 3.16, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance is written before him of them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. <clears throat> they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serves him. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that serves him not. Now, Peter was a pretty practical man, and he tells us that when a person has suffered in their body, they no longer have a desire to sin because their desires are changing with their growth 
in their spirit. He says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from disbelief. That's sin. <coughs> and this is so true. The suffering in the body is, is, is but a process that helps us to turn our real affection in the right direction. And we are looking at the process of maturing here tonight. Now, John 6, to 45 tells us, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. How many have heard but haven't learned? Knock, knock, knock. Would? Huh? Or do we have a heart? Or is our heart so hard that we've got to have it our way all the time? Are we willing to learn? Because it's not him that hath heard. It's him that hath heard and learned. So it is important that we not only hear, but we also learn. And you do not learn unless you are focused on what is being taught. People come to church many times. I don't see people taking too many notes. You ought to be taking notes. It's your your good. It's not for mine. <clears throat> it's for your good, unless you're going to the website and you're downloading the notes there. Because these things aren't just to be preached one time. They should be lived over and over and over and over again. This is God's word. John 14, 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So if you got the Holy Ghost, the Comforter is there. He's teaching, not just once a week, twice a week. He's teaching every day. Timothy 2 and 2. 2 Timothy 2 and 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among uh, many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. <clears throat> and as Brother Vell told me, he said, to be, uh, you know, a faithful, per, a faithful uh, faith, to be faithfully taught, you have to have two things. You have to have one who's faithful to teach, and you have to have the other who is, who is faithful to just shut up and listen. We have too many people today that, that, uh, that they, don't want to just, they don't want to shut up and listen, so they're not faithfully taught. Faithfully taught takes one to be a mentor and one who's being mentored. And, 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 and you don't say to the mentor, Peter, you deal with this all the time in work. You try to teach some, you know, new executive, you know, the ropes, and they, they, they think they got it all figured out. They don't last too long, do they? Well, Hebrews 5 and 12. For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. <clears throat> again, brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which you had from the beginning. And the old commandment is the word, which you had heard from the beginning. So he's saying, look, I'm not giving you anything but the word. It's not something new. It's the same thing over and over again. I'm getting back to our text this evening. We read from John 14 and 19. Yet a little while and the world seeth me no more, but you shall see me. Why? Because I'm living. And because I'm living, you're living also. Because it's me that's living your life for you. That's the only way you can see him and other people can't see him. You see him in you. Because I live, you live. That is what Jesus said. And Paul said, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. The same doxa, the same opinions, the same values. <clears throat> Notice, <clears throat> because I live, you live. What I do, you will do. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, when he appears, then you shall appear. What he does, you do. John 14, 12. It's so clear. So easy to understand. Again, John 14, 20. Jesus said, At that day you shall know. At that day you shall know that I'm in the Father. And you and me. And I'm you. Now, he didn't say, in, At that day you shall guess. In that day you shall th theologize. In that day, you'll have a theory. In that day, no, he said, that day you'll know. You'll get no go. Notice at that day, and at that day, you will be one with the Father as Jesus was one with the Father. John 17, 21. 
that they may know that, that they all may be one as thou father art in me as thou art in me and I in thee that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory the doxa the opinions values and judgments which thou gavest to me I've given to them that they may be one we become one because we have the same values. We become one because we have the same opinions. We become one because we have the same judgments, the same standards. And the, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect or mature in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, and, and thou hast loved me. <clears throat> now with that in mind, let's go back to paragraph 162, where Brother Brown says... It proves that God raised him up from the dead. You believe it? He is a living among us today. And that I is Christ. And that I is with us to the end of, of the consummation. Which means to the end of the world. See? The end of the world. According to his promised word. He promised it. And the works that I do shall you also. It's not nonsense to us. You know it is to some. But not to us he says. It's the token. It's the token. What's the token? The works that I do shall you do also. It's the token. And it's not nonsense to us. It's a reality that Christ has taken over. He's in the church. He's living in the church. He's living in individual sons and daughters of God. We accept this sacred blood sacrifice. We accept this sacred blood. Then give us, that gives us the life, the token, a seal of his promise. Ephesians 4 and 30. And grieve not blood. No. Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are covenanted, you are a, you are a token. The Holy Spirit will be the seal. <clears throat> when anything sealed inside of a seal, you better not break it. You can't break it. It's got, not God's seal, no. For you, grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed until the day of your redemption. When the body's raised up, it's a seed, a sign that the seed has been germatized with eternal life, Zoe, my own life, and I'll raise it up again at the last day. And as you walk, you have confidence that the life of Christ is in you. And you are in him. By one spirit, we're all baptized into one body and sealed there by the Holy Ghost among the believers like this until the day that Jesus raises us up. Now, in closing, Brother Brown said, in God's only provided place of worship, he said, you're sealed in there. You're beneath the blood. You don't go out no more. And then what are you? God's son in God's family, sealed in by the Holy Ghost. The devil couldn't get you if he had to, for you are dead. Your old husband part is dead. You are buried. And your life is hid in God through Christ and sealed in by the Holy Ghost. How is he going to get you? How are you going to get out? You're there. That's why I said it doesn't matter if he comes this spring or doesn't come this spring as long as he's here with us. And sealed by the Holy Ghost. How is it going to get you out? How are you going to get out? You're, you're there. Glory. Now, I will, I will leave that alone uh, just enough so that you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay. And if Paul said your life is hid in God through Christ and sealed by the Holy Ghost, then how are you going to get out? And how is the devil going to get to you? You're there. Glory, he says. Now, look at Paul, uh, what Brother Bram is telling us here. Number one, your life is hid in God through Christ. Number two, you are sealed in, so the devil can't get you. Number three, you're sealed in, so how could you ever get out or be lost? So it's time to just abolish all of that thinking. The time now is just, we're getting ready for the wedding. You know what I mean? You know, like a bride gets ready for the wedding. What she do the day before? Everything is focused on it. Do I have my dress right? Do I have my shoes? Do I have my veil? Do I have these things? Are the flowers there? Everything is focused on that day. And we should be focused on getting everything ready for his coming. Now notice how Brother Bram substituted the words, whereby you go in and you don't go out anymore until. For whereby you are sealed until. So he is telling us that the sealing in is to keep us from going out. <clears throat> then we know that those who depart from the faith in this hour, in this last hour, were never really sealed in to begin with. They could not have been sealed in if they went out. And that is why it's so important to know and understand in this hour because it brings rest to your soul. Because this is the hour of great deception and people think that they're sealed in, but they have never died yet to be born again. 
And so if they are, if they are sealed in, then what are they sealed into? There is still too much self, too much I this and me that or my this in their lives and not enough death to self, and not enough I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I am living, but it's not me that's living. It's Christ that's living in me. And we know that it is God that is working in us, both to will and to do. So are you looking at your doing and your willing, or are you looking at his doing in you and his willing in you? And if there is no doing, then it's very apparent that there is no willing as well. And if there's no doing, if there's no John 14, 12, there's no actions. Now, it doesn't have to be miracles. The things that I do, Brother Branham quotes it 400 times that way. The things that I do, it's the way you live. Conduct yourself. And if you don't see that, then apparently there's no willing to do that. And if there's no willing to do that, then there's no God in there willing and doing you understand? That ought to tell you one thing. You don't, you don't leave. You just get on your knees. And you, don't, you just get on your knees until God fills you with his spirit. That's all. You know, like Brother Brown talked about the old colored farmer. He said, he said Lordy, he said, I, I, I'm on my knees here. He was in a pig pen. He said, I ain't getting off my knees. He said, and, and, until you fill me with your Holy Ghost. He said, if you don't fill me with your Holy Ghost, you can just find a bag of bones sitting right here because I ain't leaving until I get it. You have not because you ask not. Ask abundantly. <clears throat> so if there's no God in us, then we're none of his. So we see that all things must come back to this word. Then it should be no strange thing that if, if, if it is by this word and through this word that we're sealed in, then if you are not sealed in, it is because you are not in this word. Now remember, we are living in the end time and it is very apparent that that, that one of the main attributes or characteristics of the end time is that there is going to be a falling away, which shows that those who fall away were never sealed in to begin with. Because Brother Brown said, if we are sealed in, uh, then, then we are sealed in and can't go out. And we, we wouldn't want to go out for any reason. Now, this leads us to another thought about this sealing in, because we find there's a group of people who will be sealed in, and there's also another group who are, who are not sealed in. And yet both are aware of the presence of Christ or the prusy of Christ in the last days. Yet the ones who are sealed in will not be deceived and they, will, they will, and, and they will not go out from the presence of Christ. But those not sealed into the presence of Christ will not be able to stay in his presence as we see in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 to 10. <coughs> don't have time to get into it. <coughs> Just read it for yourself. But there's going to be two groups there that are aware of his presence. It says those that are, go out from the presence of God and those who actually he comes to be glorified in. Second Thessalonians, well, I guess we're going to read it. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them who know not God, who have no ginosko, have no uh, intimate experiential knowledge of God, and that obey not, notice it all comes down to what they do, and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. In other words, no glory and no presence. In other words, because they know not God, they have not idol of God, they have not an awareness of him and his nature, and thus they obey not the gospel, and thus they are put out of his presence and put out of his reach, the reach of his glory, his opinions, his values, his judgments. In other words, these people hear about his presence with their ears, but since their heart are far from him, they are not aware of him. <clears throat> and I believe that that is because they are self-focused, and thus their own opinions, their own values, and their own judgments mean more to them than God's. And thus they are not permitted to remain in his presence. But Jesus was just the opposite. He said, Father, my will is this, but you know what? Not my will. It's your will. But now look at the other group who are aware of his presence and fully comprehend his nature. It says of them, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be marred in all them that believe, because our Paul's testimony was uh, among you was believed in that day. <coughs> Wherefore also we pray also always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the works of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified, and doxazo, in you. In other words, that the, that, the, that the glory of God, the doxa of God, may be magnified 
in you and ye in him according to the grace of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So I leave you with one question tonight before we partake of the communion table. And I ask you this question. There's two people we saw, two groups we saw. The ones that go out from the presence and the ones who stay in the presence and are glorified. They, they, are, they are endoxazo. They have the opinions of God, the values of God in their life. So which one are you? Are you the one who is aware of his presence? So aware that you live your life in accordance with that awareness? Or are you so into self that you are missing the change that is sweeping God's bride all over the world? Because Romans 12 tells us that we are transformed by the renewing of what? The mind. So the transformation begins in your mind, in your heart, and in your soul, because that's where the soul resides, and then it moves out to the body. That's why under the shout, the transforming power of God through that message is already beginning the transformation that will make you ready for the voice of the resurrection when the others get their change and you, and you get yours here. All right. From El Shaddai, Brother Brown said, we've got to have an awakening right quick or you're going to miss the rapture, friends. It could happen at any time. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious, gracious Father, we love you, Lord, with all that lays within us, <clears throat> body, soul, and spirit. We love you with all our strength, all our, all our, all our efforts, everything, Father. <clears throat> and, Lord, we just ask you to help us. One thing we ask you, Father. Help us to die to ourself. Help us to be crucified to ourself. That you might live in us. That you might live our life for us. That you might take over our being and possess us with your own spirit. That when we speak, people would be confused. They say, sometimes that's Brian speaking. Sometimes that's God speaking. That each and every one of us might be of that nature. And that the Brian would be speaking less and the Christ would be speaking more and more. May we so be one focus, single focused, O oh God, on one thing. And that's getting ready for that blessed day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have the deacons bring forth the elements at this time. And we'll open our Bibles to uh, John chapter 13. <clears throat> we'll take our text for the communion. Brother Josh, you can go ahead and turn off the uh, cameras at this time. Thank you. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper having been ended, the devil now having put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. And Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God, and that he went to God, he rises from supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded him. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them, which with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answering said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus saith unto him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And Simon Peter then saith unto him, Well, Lord, then not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. <coughs> and Jesus said to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So after he had washed her feet, and had taken his garment, and was set down again, he saith unto them, Know ye what I have done to you. You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. If I've done it, you should do it. The works that I do, you should do. You realize tonight, 
Just in this little communion ceremony, you're participating in John 14, 12. The works that I do, you shall do also. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. For if you know these things, happy are you if you, what? Do them. Well, we could just leave it at that. <clears throat> I'm ready to participate in John 14, 12 tonight. To wash my brother's feet. You know why? Because he did it. As an example for me to do also. Let's bow our heads in prayer as the brothers would ask a blessing over these elements. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. Numbers uh, to be like Jesus. Let's see here. Sixty-seven. Sixty-seven. In that okay. 